Good afternoon. This is Donovan Carter with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Uh, we are in Gainesville, Florida, in the lovely home of Mr. Scott Camille. And today, I am with... Bruce Hunt. Um, and also... Deborah Hendricks. Um, and today, we are interviewing the incredible... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to that kind of introduction. <laughs> Larry Turner. Thank you so much today for joining us, Mr. Turner. Sure. Um, and can you just state once again and spell your name for the record, please? Uh, Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, middle name Gibbs, G-I-B-B-S, Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R. -E okay. Um, and um, I'm going to call you Mr. Turner. Uh, wh where were you, when, when and where were you born, Mr. Turner? <laughs> really? March 29, <laughs> 1944. Yes, I really am that old. Uh, in Mariana, Florida. Okay, okay. Um, now, uh, did you grow up in a military family at all? I did not. You did not? Okay. Uh, and I understand that... Well, I guess that depends on your... <laughs> let me think about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have two older brothers, both of whom were officers in the United States Navy during Vietnam. Oh. The reason I was not an officer in the Vietnam, in the United States Navy, is that I, uh, I applied, I was in law school, thought I would get in the JAG Corps and um, turned out that they had filled their quota. Mm. Um, so I um, was subject to be drafted, um, took a summer job working in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, running a program for uh, uh, what was then called Sunland Training Center. I got a um, ear infection. It, le it, had, it left a hole in my eardrum. I showed up for my physical, and they determined I was not physically qualified to serve in the United States Army, and I did not argue with them. Yeah, I understand that. Um, could you talk about, uh, you said you two, are these two of your older older brothers? Two of my older brothers, okay. right. Okay, um, and how many people would you know in, maybe in your immediate circle who were drafted or who served? Oh goodness, you know, this was Vietnam. Uh, well, in my immediate circle, of course, most of the people were in college. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, if you were in college, you were deferred. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I was supposed to be deferred while I was in college, but the head of the draft board in Mariana decided that those of us who were in college getting draft deferrals uh, should be, uh, 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 we're, we're draft dodgers. There was some mm -hmm. truth to that. Uh, and um, didn't like it. Um, so he re reclassified us 1A and uh, we were subject to the, draft, to the draft. And that was before the lottery. Uh, And 1A meant that... Keep the 1A meant you were going to, to, to war. Okay. <clears throat> it, it, it was the classification meant, that meant that you were qualified for draft, being mm -hmm. drafted. There, were, there was 1A, then there was something else, Y, and then the 4F, I think, was under no way are you going. And mm -hmm. I was a 1Y or whatever, the, the middle ground. Okay. Women and children first, and then they would go to people like me. Okay. Wow. Um, now, <clears throat> what was the public attitude towards the war, and how to have you, kind of while you were in school and uh, first, and also did you notice maybe, when did that start to change? Oh goodness. Um, all right, I grew up in a small town where um, we all believed that Uncle Sam could do no wrong, and, and uh, uh, it was a democratic uh, community or dem a community of Democrats because when I registered to vote, I was told if I didn't register as a Democrat, you wouldn't have a vote that counted <clears throat> because the, the, basically the, there were no Republicans. Um, but the Democrats were, uh, you know, still fighting the Civil War. <clears throat> and uh, uh, gosh, I don't know how much of this to tell you try to make a long story short. So I, I happened to be lucky enough to be uh, born into a family with wonderful parents. Uh, and my mother was just a wonderful lady and she knew, she was in, intuitively an honest, honorable, liberal thinking feminist lady, and, but also lady and all of that. Uh, just a lovely person. 
and strongly influenced me and my brothers. Uh, my brothers went into the military because they had no choice. Uh, they weren't looking to fight a war. Uh, they both served and were honorably discharged. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, at first I wasn't paying much attention to it when I was in high school. In college I began paying attention to it, but I was really focused on my studies. I did not party a lot in college. I learned my first semester that I needed to study if I was going to be in college after making all C's. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I really uh, learned how to study and uh, got an uh, academic scholarship to law school, so I went to law school. And, um, and there interacted some with people of a, a more liberal thinking. Um, but still not paying as much attention as I might. <clears throat> uh, knew I was against it. If you ask me why, I'm not sure how many re different reasons I would give and how, how much I, uh, what, what they might have been. I mean, I, if that matters, I can try to resurrect that, but I'm guessing it doesn't matter. Um, and, um, but I began seeing the shift as, it, as more and more demonstrations happened and more and more st stuff happened. You know, Kent State got everybody's attention by way of example. And, um, and, and it, before long, you know, I think many people of my generation believed that th this is a war we shouldn't be in. And I'm sorry, I'll try to quit hitting that microphone with my hand. Um, and, and we ought to get out, out of it, and, 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 and people on either side were being killed. Atrocities were being committed on either side, including ours, and we like to believe that Americans didn't do that sort of stuff, but, you know, we were seeing stuff on television, and we're hearing stories and reading stories that clearly American soldiers did do that stuff. Um, so, um, as I said, I didn't want to go in, I, uh, but it, as much as, as any reason, I didn't want to go in. If I, could, if I was going to go in as a draftee, and I had about half of a law degree at that time, <clears throat> they would try to push me into the front line. Well, I'd wind up going to OCS, I'd wind up a lieutenant, I'd live about 48 hours once I got to Vietnam. Um, I wasn't eager to do that. So um, uh, I was happy to have the hole in my eardrum. And I am hearing impaired today. I do not make any claim to the VA for that. Mm. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, where did you attend law school? University of Florida, Gainesville. Oh, okay, yeah. 11, okay, cool. Um, and you went to undergrad here yes. as well? Or? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, sorry, one moment. <clears throat> So, you talked about how you didn't really have much of an opinion on the war necessarily as much. Um, you know, in your high school time, even in your undergraduate days, you were focused on your studies, especially after that tumultuous first semester. Um, but perhaps could you reflect on things you were told about the war? You know, think about maybe why the war was being fought or? Well, the, the war was be being fought in keep America great and, and free from communism. Uh, you know, stop it on the, uh, over there on the land of other people so that it doesn't reach us. Um, and it, uh, I don't remember much justification that made any sense um, more than that uh, kind of uh, phrasing. Um, but I know that I became more and more against the war uh, because of the things that, that I've already spoken about. <coughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. And what did you think of perhaps politics of the time? Like, were you more involved? Did you like Nixon, for example? Like, what did no, no, I was one of the few people. Uh, well, Gainesville is, a, and you know this from living here, is a kind of an oasis uh, uh, in a, surrounded by a lot of uh, very conservative to far right wing people. Uh, and um, because of my, my parenting, um, uh, I fit into the Gainesville th way of thinking about life and, and other people very easily. I desegregated a, an elementary school uh, up in Panama City. If I was there, it was desegregated. If I wasn't there that day, it was all black. Um, so it was the very first phase of, of desegregation. Um, so that was, you know, that's the kind of life I had. 
um, and 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 it was not standard for a little town like Mariana, but it's it's it's, it's I was lucky enough to have it. So I was listening and paying attention, um, but also, you know, I was in law school and, and, and working. Uh, I got a job law clerking for a law firm, uh, uh, and um, that actually was a major uh, bonus to me as a, a young lawyer, and then stayed with the firm when I graduated, prosecuted for the state attorney's office for 13 months, and then went and practiced with one of the partners in that firm. Um, his name is Sally Golden. And if you check on Sally Golden, the Florida Bar annually uh, awards uh, uh, a, someone the Golden Sally Golden uh, Award for uh, contribution to the criminal justice system, whether you be a prosecutor or uh, a defense attorney, public or private, or an educator. Um, uh, so he. Um, he was an outstanding lawyer who died at the age of 41, but up until that time he was outstanding. He was also right wing. Um, I was not, <laughs> but we were law partners. Yes. And he taught me a lot about lawyering, as did the other partners in the firm. Mm. Absolutely. Let me give them a plug. Yeah. Dick Jones, still practicing law, great lawyer here in Gainesville. Ben Montench, good lawyer, famous for his son, Ben Montench, who was the uh, keyboardist for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Wow, it's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> had to say that. <laughs> very much so. Um, so what was the attitude of people who were opposed to the war? Like, or I should, I'm gonna reframe that question. How did, you know, let's say war hawks, let's say for instance, people who were, you know, gung-ho about the war, what was kind of the attitude towards, you know, people who opposed the war? What was that? Well, I think that depended on, on where you were. There were people who were ladies and gentlemen about it, and there were people who wanted to fight about it. Uh, one of my brother's classmates in, in our high school, to this day when he sees me, greets me by saying, hello, communist. Now, I, I, I subscribe, frankly, to some of the communist views, but I was never a communist. I mm -hmm. was and am a registered Democrat. Mm -hmm. I'm a flaming liberal mm -hmm. registered Democrat, but I'm a Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, it, it would depend. There were, I mean, uh, so that, you, that's a sufficient answer. Then yes. I'll shut up. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, it depends. I, I get that completely. Um, I tell you what, it's yeah. a lot then like it is right now in this country. It's. Mm. Uh, Maybe worse now, but you know there was the John Birch Society, uh, um, uh, the Chicago Seven thing had happened uh, happened you know a few years before this case. Um, uh, uh, so most most of the students I knew were against the war, mm. and most of the students I knew did not. Well, I started to say did not trust the government, D did not trust the. Washington government, I guess, um, but that's not completely true. I know that I continued to think they were trustworthy until I became a lawyer in this case. Mm -hmm. And as I began to see more and more and more of what was truly going on by the government intentionally to try to uh, convict these young men that they had indicted, um, and, and, and frankly, the, the, the depths that they would step or go to 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 try to do that, um, and if you want me to talk, those are the things you need to ask me questions about, because mm -hmm. I can tell you some stories there that you'll find interesting <coughs> and entertaining. Um, um, so um, that was the kind of people I knew. Um, many uh, people, many men back then who, uh, were in t doing things intentionally to avoid the draft. I have a friend who shot himself in the foot. Mm. Uh, blew off a toe mm. and avoided the draft. Uh, <clears throat> mm. And do you re perhaps recall when, um, was there ever like a shift in the attitude of the youth sp perci no. specifically? Did I'm, they I ever, mean, you know? I mean, it wasn't a flip of a switch, you know, it was a process. Uh, uh, I mean, there were the knee jerks on both sides, I'm sure. The knee jerks I was most aware of were uh, the more conservative people. Um, but the, um, 
uh, and just because they were more outspoken about, pr again, pretty much like today. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, but but it, it was, I think, for many of us, we, we, of, of that generation, you know, our parents were the so-called great generation. You know, they were the World War II generation. I was born in 1944. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, uh, so, you know, they were strong supporters of the government, and, and, and understandably so. <coughs> and, but, all right, don't go there. I was about to go down and tell you why all that was, but you know that. And uh, uh, so I, um, we were struggling with what is right and what's wrong. And, you know, our hair was getting longer. There are photographs of me as a young lawyer with my hair down to here. Um, uh, when I was a prosecutor, I got my hair cut very short. Um, and the uh, first day I was there, the state attorney asked me why I said, he said I needed a haircut. I just had a haircut the day before. Um, years later, he would grab me by my hair. Well, when I was no longer in his office, we became good friends. And he would say, I don't get it. I hate hippies, but I love you. Why do I love you? Well, I loved him, too, you know. So and, and we were proud of that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I want to circle back to your how you became involved in the case itself. <clears throat> sure. Um, were you practicing? This was, I assume, in posts, like your prosecution time doing that. And was this while you were in your own practice, or no? <clears throat> I was um, a partner in a firm that was at the time was called. I guess it was just Golden and Turner. <clears throat> um, at some point, we added a lawyer, uh, Bob Cates, um, uh, and it was Golden, uh, Turner, and Cates. Um, but when I was when I was involved in this case, <clears throat> it was just Golden and Turner. Um, <clears throat> and Sally Golden was who I told you he was, and uh, an outstanding lawyer and, and a, 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 a mentor to me. They taught me a lot. Who taught me a lot. <clears throat> And um, we were general practitioners. You, it, those, this was the uh, early 1970s. Um, most lawyers uh, uh, were GPs. There were uh, some who specialized. But that was beginning to happen, but nothing like it is today. The doctors were GPs. Now, you know, you've got to get a fingernail specialist if you've got a broken fingernail. Uh, and if it's a thumb and not a finger, then you've got to get another specialist. And I'm being facetious. But, but lawyers are very specialized now. Then we did everything. Um, and at that time, I was still doing everything. Uh, the, um, the How I got into this case is I met Scott Camille. I met Scott Camille because he got arrested on a kidnapping for ransom charge, which at the time was a capital offense. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States had ruled that you, that you could only use capital punishment in certain cases, and it didn't include kidnapping, um, pretty much uh, first-degree murder cases, as I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was then life in prison. And it was a—all um, right, this is an oral history, so I can't say bullshit. If I could, I would say this was a bullshit case, <laughs> and it truly was. I mean, it was—what it really was was, at that time, <clears throat> The Vietnam veterans against the war were, were under intense investigation by the federal government because they were they had a level of credibility uh, with the public because they had been there and done that and they had come back and and said, "Gosh, what I did was wrong." Uh, and so they were getting a lot of attention and um, and, and the move the public mood was mood was moving against the war and against the government's position on it. Nick, Richard Nixon made it easy, uh, an easy target for that because he was not a very likable guy um, uh, or likable president. President, so um, that's sort of the environment. Uh, so they they've got the local chapters, the one that Scott was the president of, just infiltrated with spies. Um, we didn't know it at the time, but you've heard these stories, so I won't go into those except that that was going on. They didn't know it was going on, of course. Um, and so when the kidnapping charges came, what happened, as I recall it, is Scott was out of town. I think he was in Orlando uh, talking, uh, doing anti-war talking. Um, and there was a sen senator from Alaska, 
whose last name escapes me, G-R-A something, um, who was down there as well. While Scott was gone, oh, and the VVAW, or at least some of them, I think all of them, <clears throat> were supporting them, themselves financially by selling marijuana. <clears throat> and they were, had a perfect setup for this. They had people who knew how to fly airplanes. They, knew, they had people all over the United States. Um, and they knew how to take orders and, and, and do what they were supposed to do. So they were doing that. And a couple of young guys uh, had gotten, had, had fronted to them, fronted meaning for your, those who don't know, I assume you guys know, uh, means take it, sell it, pay us what you owe us, keep the rest. Um, they had fronted, uh, the, the local guys had fronted some marijuana to these young guys and, um, uh, and they got ripped off. These young g gentlemen <laughs> were foolish enough to rip them off. So they went out and grabbed them, and brought them to the, uh, the, what was called the VVAW house, um, and held them there until Scott came back. And when Scott got back, and he talked to these guys, and you've met Scott, Scott can be as charming as any human being in the world. I mean, he is a very charming man. And, and he uh, said, he let this guy go. He doesn't have anything to do with this. And he told the other guy who had a job working for Fat Boys Barbecue. Um, uh, and uh, which was out on Waldo Road, the same one that's there now. And that was the original uh, Sonny's Fat Boys Barbecue. His kid was working for Sonny. Um, and he said he could go get the money from Sonny um, to, to pay what he owed. So Scott let him go. Off he went. And then he got a, Scott gets a phone call <clears throat> that says, I got your money. Um, meet me at such and such a place. So Scott and his girlfriend um, show up together to, to, to collect the money. Um, and um, the guy uh, gives the money and Scott gives him a receipt. This is, I'm not making this up, writes out a receipt and gives him a receipt for the money that he has received, at which time the cops come out and arrest Scott and his girlfriend and charge them with capital uh, kidnapping. Uh, oh, wow. So it was, Scott's mother somehow talked to a law professor at the University of Florida who had taught me. I don't know why th that he referred that case to me. I mean, uh, I was not, not particularly well known at that time. I was out of law school at that time, less than two years, probably less than a year and a half. Um, uh, Golden was known very well and very regarded. I've always thought that Golden wasn't there. He wasn't at the time, and the call got routed to me. <clears throat> and um, Scott was telling. So I so I wound up talking to um, Professor Glicksburg, Manny Glicksburg, a terrific guy. I liked him a lot. Uh, and uh, and then I talked to Scott's mother, and then I went out to the jail and met with Scott. Um, and I wound up representing him on the kidnapping case. Mm -hmm. Not very long thereafter, <clears throat> um, all the spies began to come, some of the spies began to come out of the woodwork and they arrested Scott and others, well, I guess just Scott, for dealing marijuana. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we took that case to trial and we got a not guilty verdict in there. Mm -hmm. um, I'll share this with you. The first time in my life I ever smoked marijuana was the night before that trial when Scott showed up at my house and said, you got to know what you're dealing with here. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about as nervous as a person could be when I showed up in court the next day. <laughs> can they tell? I bet they can tell. <laughs> well, they couldn't apparently, or they didn't care. And um, we got a not guilty verdict uh, in, in that case. Uh, and. Um, and then the Gainesville 8 uh, stuff began to, to emerge. Scott and others were subpoenaed to the grand jury in Tallahassee. You've heard this story. I won't repeat that. Um, uh, some of them went to jail uh, because they wouldn't cooperate. Or, uh, uh, and and but this happened to coincide with the Democratic National Convention, so they weren't at that convention. We've always thought that was why they were subpoenaed before a grand jury. It wasn't just uh, serendipity that it was planned. And so um, uh, uh, 
that, that they, they, they released. None of them are asked to appear before the grand jury, and uh, are none of the ones who wind up being indicted. Uh, they got indicted, um, and uh, an arraignment for, on the new charges, purely serendipitously, was the week of the Republican National Convention. <laughs> how funny how those coincidences happen. <laughs> um, Scott, by then, and I were really loved each other. I mean, we really knew each other, and, and I trusted him as I do to this day, uh, and he did me. Uh, and uh, and we would do anything for each other. He's one, mm -hmm. one of my beloved brothers. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the lawyers were engaged. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights out of New York City got involved. Thank God, wonderful lawyers, wonderful people. Uh, I'm still not in the case. I'm, I have the other stuff. They've got other local counsel uh, who are help on, helping them out. You need to have a local lawyer to, in order to practice in the in the local court if you're not uh, licensed in Florida. Uh, so that was that, um, and um, and Scott decided he wanted me to be in this case because because of what I've already told you, um, and. Um, <clears throat> I was happy to do it. The problem was they didn't really have any money to pay, um, and Scott owed the firm money <laughs> already. Um, but I talked to my partner, uh, Sally Golden, and we decided that I, that I would take the case if they would cover the costs, and, and we would we'd do it without a fee. And he would cover all my all the other work because we knew it was going to be a black hole mm -hmm. that was going to take up all of our all of my time. But he would run the office, um, and that's what we did. And so um, I um, was telling the story a few minutes ago to some of the people downstairs. Uh, the first time I met with the other lawyers it was um, a boy from Mariana, Florida, uh, who had been to New York City once in his life on a uh, senior class field trip. <laughs> <laughs> Flew up to New York, on, uh, uh, arrived at night, I don't know why I did that. Uh, there. Their office was in a, what appeared to me to be a very scary neighborhood for, <laughs> for a young guy like me. And, uh, um, and I met with the uh, lawyers from the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights and, and, uh, and fell in love, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and then made that trip several times. And, um, and then I'll tell you when you're ready for some of the funny things that happen on trips between um, the Gainesville, Florida, and, uh, and New York City, because funny yeah. things happen when you got the federal government watching everything you do. <laughs> I bet. Um, so I want to get a, a little bit clearer picture of this timeline here. So there's the grand jury. This is before this or after this? Yeah, that would have, the grand jury would have been, in, uh, in, uh, I'm pretty sure, in 72. I graduated law school in, in uh, 70, worked for the state's attorney's office, um, worked for the law firm for six months, <clears throat> went to the state attorney's office for 13, and then back. So um, uh, the trial was actually the ranger may have been 71. You'll need to get that from somebody else. Um, no, 71, I was in the state's attorney's office. So. Uh, yeah, I left the state attorney's office in October of '71. Um, so I and I so it would have been '72 when the other charges happened, and probably '72 when this indictment came down, <clears throat> and the trial was in '73. Okay, gotcha. So, 50 years ago this month. Wow, wow. So. Indictment and then pretrial is when you met the when you went to New York and started trying. Yeah, I mean, as soon as as soon as as, as we agreed that that we meaning, <laughs> I'll tell you this story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I met Scott, and Scott was all in on having me in the case, but I had to get the approval of some of the other people, and I literally was in an attic, a dark attic, 
in his house, not this one, in his house, with a lit candle. <laughs> Honest to God. I mean, it's like something out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm getting uh, interviewed for the job by, by the guy who was really the big daddy in, in, in making the decisions. <laughs> I mean, what am I doing here? But So, um, hell, I don't know how I got off on that. That's how I got the job in <laughs> That's I passed the interview. Apparently. That's good. Yeah, it's a true That's story. Good. That's good. Um, so, how did the Center for Constitutional Rights? How did those attorneys? You know, I don't know who reached out to them. To tell you the truth, I think. Probably the guys from Texas, and I'm pretty sure that's right. There were two lawyers from Texas because two of the defendants were from Texas. Um, and um, um, they and they had been represented by these two lawyers, really, really good lawyers. Uh, and again, I can give you names if you need them, but you probably have it already. Uh, uh, and Cam Cunningham and um, Brady uh, Coleman. Uh, and uh, these guys were a few years older, older than I was, uh, a few less than 10 and more than five, but I don't know, uh, but long enough to have mo no more than I knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they got the center involved. Uh, that wasn't too hard. It looked like this was another uh, effort by the federal government to, to squelch the uh, uh, activism against the war. Um, and they were doing other cases to do that, of course. Um, none of them very successfully, but, but they were trying. Uh, so I, I think that's how, how that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, story time. What are some, you mentioned some funny stuff going on traveling. Let, let me give you just some highlights of the stuff that the government did that took a it, it, it took a, a kid from Mariana who's leaning a little left in a community where that's not common, uh, although there were others. I'm not, I'm not the only one. I've got good friends who have very similar politics today, and, and I sure did then, um, and changed me into, um, you know, a, a guy who is very distrustful of, of government. Uh, uh, and let me just be clear, when I say of government, I'm not talking about everyone in government. There are people, good people in government. We need more good people in government. I just had an argument, not an argument, a conversation with those guys downstairs when they were telling their stories about how they get out of jury duty. They just tell them what they really think and they knock them off the jury. I said, yeah, and you're the guys I want to see on a jury. I want to see somebody on there who's against the death penalty, mm -hmm. not everybody who's in favor of the death penalty, uh, because that makes it real hard to avoid the death penalty if we lose the trial. Uh, but people just, they, they want to tell you story or tell me stories mm -hmm. about how they, yeah, I got suspended, but I didn't have to go because I didn't have to do it because I told them this. And so um, I, uh, I don't know how I went off on that either. Um, so your question was, Tell you some stories. Um, I um, not the first trip I went to New York to meet with the lawyers there. Um, Morton Davis, Nancy Stearns, and what's her first name? Peterson, wonderful lady. One of the things that happens when you are almost 80 years old, which I will be in six months, uh, is um, you don't remember things like you used to. Doris Peterson. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first time I, uh, sec second time I went up there, I think, <clears throat> I uh, had a, a large oversized briefcase because I had all sorts of stuff I had to carry back and forth with me. Um, and uh, I bought it for that specific purpose. And um, when, uh, and, and actually my first wife was with me. Uh, there have been three. Um, go ahead and get that over with. Um, and uh, I love all three of them and they all three love me and that's the truth also. So we get past that. Uh, so Patricia and I were up there and um, when we were finished, we were flying back. <clears throat> And one of the deals I made with, with the, 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 the defendants was, I'm flying first class. I'm not going to work all day hard, fly at nighttime. That's why I was up there at nighttime. Fly at nighttime, 
squeezed in between other people. I need to be able to work and I need to be able to relax. And I need to be able to drink. Back then they gave you drinks. So on the, so I, on the way back, I, I'm taking those little bottles and drinking them. Uh, and um, so we get on the plane and I've got that briefcase with me and I had flown up there, I think, at least one other time, maybe two other times with that same briefcase. So it would not have been the second time, it would have been later. And um, uh, and you weren't supposed to carry any briefcase on that wouldn't go in the overhead or wouldn't go under the seat. Well, this would do neither, but nobody had ever said anything to me about it going up or coming back. So we get on the plane, the briefcase is right here in front of me where it's always been, and this guy in a navy blue uniform and wings, or at least that's not right, um, the airline, uh, Eastern Airlines, uh, had their symbol was wings, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't he wasn't pilots it wasn't pilots wings, but the, 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 their logo, mm -hmm. and this gentleman comes on and uh, comes up to me and says uh, you can't uh, you'll have to check that 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 bag and I said why he says it's oversized where you're not allowed to do it well I knew that was the rule I also knew it was uh, wasn't enforced, and I said. Um, well, why can't we just um, put it in an empty seat and strap it in, which had been done before. I can't do that. Uh, what if we put it between the bulkhead, at that time there was a solid bulkhead between first class and the other people, <laughs> the great unwashed, they didn't get to sit up there. There was the, the bulkhead and there was room behind the seats and the bulkhead where it had been put before. Couldn't do that. Um, had to take it. I'm still learning, but the alarms are starting to go off. <clears throat> so I opened the briefcase and I remove some of the stuff that I've got in there, um, but I don't remove everything. But I, re I removed what was while I got this guy breathing down my neck and everybody's ready to t t taxi down the runway and take off. Uh, I removed what I thought in that little bit of time needed to be removed and held it in my lap because it was loose. <clears throat> and uh, he took the briefcase, and I turned to, we got up in the air, and I, and I, I don't know why I didn't notice this before, there were in the first class section three empty seats. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other people in the first class section with an oversized briefcase, the same size as mine. Mm -hmm. And I turned to Patricia and I said, if we get to Gainesville and that briefcase isn't there, I am going to be really unhappy. Well, guess what? <laughs> we get to Gainesville, no briefcase. no briefcase, and it arrives days later. Uh, I do get it back, and the question I always get asked, well, had anybody tampered with it or was anything missing? I said, I don't know. No. You know, in the first place, I just stuffed stuff in there anyhow, and then I'd taken stuff out. You know, I'm going to organize it when I got back home, uh, uh, back to the office. Um, so I, I, I don't have any idea if everything in there was copied or, or anything. Mm. Uh, but there was information in there that the government shouldn't have. It was what lawyers call work product, which is protected by law, um, as is their work product sometimes. Sometimes it's not because they overstep sometimes. Um, so um, that was one of the early things that happened. Mm. There was a lawyer in Gainesville named Carol Scott who had represented Scott Camille on an earlier non-criminal thing, I don't remember what it was, or maybe it was criminal, um, and before I knew him, and had uh, Scott had thought he was going to ask her to represent him in the kidnapping case, and um, his um, mother and, and, uh, and, and uh, this law professor intervened, and he hired me, or got me, well, no, he hired me for that. Uh, Carol had um, a reputation as a bit of a firebrand and, 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 and well earned and, and one that she would be proud of uh, and as uh, 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 an anti-war activist um, um, and a woman who had a what I call head, heart and balls. She had, he was smart, she had a heart and she was not afraid of anybody and, uh, um, and she was uh, a, a lovely lady. I say was, I think she's still alive, but she moved from Gainesville not, not many years later, but she, um, her office got burglarized. Um, and um, she reports that 
she looked everywhere to see what was taken, and the only thing that was missing was her file on Scott Camille. Mm. As the case ground on pre-trial, we were going back and forth to Pensacola. The case was a Gainesville Division case in the Northern District of Florida. Uh, Pensacola is in the Northern District as well, but, as well, but not the Gainesville Division. It's in the Pensacola Division. And the judge very much wanted to move the trial from Gainesville to Pensacola, which you may know is a military town. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so it uh, would not be a good venue for this case. Um, and um, was requiring us to travel from Gainesville to him uh, to whenever there were hearings. So there would be a, a day or, of hearings or two days of hearings, and we would all have to drive well, the guys from Texas came from Texas, from New York came from New York. I drove from Gainesville to Pensacola uh, um, for, for the hearings. Uh, and um, so we're over there in, in front of this judge, and one of the things that has happened is the v VVAW had made a uh, documentary called Winning Hearts and Minds, and I'm guessing you've heard about this as well. And is it when you've heard about other stuff, no reason for me to tell you, or I'm assuming you have that somewhere, or do you want me to tell you more about well, it, or what? You can, yes, you can elaborate a little bit on the, the well, documentary. Well, winning, winning Hearts and Mind won, won a, 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 an award at the Cannes Film Festival mm -hmm. one year back then, wow. and they were using it. They, I think my memory is there were two copies. Now that that could very easy easily be wrong, but that there were a limited number of copies and they were using them as part of their fundraising to raise money for the defense fund. <clears throat> and th there was a chapter, a Jacksonville chapter um, uh, of, of the VVAW and the, I don't know what the head of the chapter would be called, the president or whatever he was called, uh, uh, had a copy of that film in his home. Uh, and his home was burglarized and the film was stolen. Wow. Wow. So we filed a motion. Now I should say here, we filed it as a big we. It was really these more experienced, smarter lawyers than Larry Turner <clears throat> who said, let's file a motion. And they, they, we filed a motion saying, this is what happened. <clears throat> we think the FBI is behind it. We think these two new members to that chapter uh, our FBI spies or snitches, uh, and we want them to come to court and we want our film back. Now, I have to tell you, I've been a judge in addition to a lawyer. I can't think of a legal basis for granting that motion. I really can't. And I don't, even today, I wouldn't file that. Well, today I probably would file that motion. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was also a bullshit motion. <laughs> but it was a good one because what happened is that thing worked its way up through channels, the motion did, and we got a, the, the, the um, head of the FBI wrote a letter that said in short summary, um, let's see, I don't remember the guy's names that we named, call them one and two. Uh, number one uh, did work, has worked uh, as a, uh, un, an uh, undercover pers a person for the FBI in the past. Didn't say anything about number two. We've got your film and you can have it back. At which point the judge says, okay, no problem. <laughs> you can have your film back. Wow. And what is it? Now, by now, I'm taking more of an active role. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and he says, so what's the problem, Mr. Turner? And I said, the problem is we want him to quit burglarizing our homes. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. that's the problem. Uh, the judge was a well-intentioned guy who was just not able to believe that his government would do what his government was doing. Uh, he was of the the, the great generation, um, you know, he was an older man, he probably served in World War II, um, I'm sure he did, <clears throat> and um, uh, he just, you know, he, people he believed he could trust, he assumed he, he, he was a federal judge, you know, you don't lie to a federal judge, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I'll keep those, I was about to say unless you're Donald Trump, but I'm not going to say that either. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so, um, 
uh, that was as far as he was concerned was was the the end of that inquiry. Um, gosh, there's so many of these stories. Uh, another story, and no, not in chronological order, but another thing that happened. We're in the middle of jury selection. Okay, fast forward. We're we're mm. picking a jury. Now, in federal court, and I'd been in federal court uh, several times by this time, even in my young career, <clears throat> and in federal court, as in state court, you get, you at that time, you got a list of all of the jurors who had been summoned for that day, mm -hmm. uh, for, for that trial, mm -hmm. basically. And it's a long list. And you got, that list would be sent out usually about Thursday or Friday before the Monday the trial was going to begin. Uh, the assumption from all federal judges is you're going to work over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would get it and you would try to learn as much as you could about these people. I would ask people, do you know this person? You know, you know this, what can you tell me? Well, the, he had ruled that that was not going to happen this time because they truly believed, I think truly believed, that these guys were going to uh, hurt people. And you have to understand, mm -hmm. these defendants, uh, except for John Niffen, uh, had served in Vietnam and they all dressed in what I c kidded about then as Vietnam veteran drag. They wore je their jeans and badges and boots, long beards. They looked scary and menacing as hell. I mean, you see what Scott looks like right now. You wouldn't <laughs> want to run into him in a dark alley. Mm -hmm. Now, although once you talk to him, you'd love him, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, but I mean, you know, they, they looked scary. Um, and they were accused of all this horrible stuff uh, about, you know, what they were going to do at the Republican National Convention and start a, a war with the cops and, and shoot and kill people and blame it on, on the cops. Uh, and um, so um, the judge was not going to let us know much about it. And so what we did, we had lots of motion hearings that went on before we ever got to the case to the, to the Gainesville courthouse. We were able to get the judge to agree the Gainesville case stays here. We'll come to you on everything else. And he grudgingly agreed to that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, and um, so um, what we, what we contrived was <clears throat> as soon as the jurors were called into the courtroom and the jury selection process was to begin, uh, one of the uh, other lawyers would stand up and say, Your Honor, I'm, I've got uh, something I need to discuss with the court. I've got an issue I need to take up with the court. And the judge would very angrily say, oh, rah, 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 okay, take the jury out. And, um, but that was after they had handed out what was called a venire, the list of prospective juries, V-E-N-I-R-E, the venire. Uh, and we, we, had a we had copies of it, and I had a copy of it, and it was prearranged. I went out of the courtroom, outside, down the street, to uh, a law firm that was friendly to me. Um, and uh, this is one of the reasons you have a local lawyer, um, is he knows people. Uh, and, um, and I took it down there, and they had a Xerox machine. Now, if you, other than this lady who might have been alive in 1973, you two were not. In 1973, a Xerox machine was about as big as this thing if not bigger, and you would put a piece of paper down here on a screen, and this thing would roll over it and say, back, and it would print one copy. And then it would, and it printed another copy. So it was not a fast process. It took quite a while. Um, you checking on me? Make sure you tell them the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling them you'll like this story. Uh, I'm telling them about, I'm getting to the FBI agents in the broom closet. Ah. <laughs> so, so, so um, uh, I take it down there. They make copies of it. We've already got a network of people who have agreed to review the list of these people and complete a questionnaire that we have had prepared telling us, do you know this person? Where do they work? What do they do? I don't know this person. I, I know them, but I go to church with them. I don't know where they work. That kind of information. Included in that were, were questions um, prior to that, we had some people working on the case who were social scientists, and you may know about this. And, and they had done a survey uh, in the uh, same area from which jurors are, are, are pulled. Um, and, uh, and in, fact, in fact had replicated that process and randomly gotten people and luckily didn't get anybody who was actually pulled and mm -hmm. the odds of that were very small. Um, 
and then interviewed him and did a, an interview that was a combination of getting the, the, the Demo uh, uh, name, rank, and serial number information and attitudinal stuff, trying to see if there was any correlation between work, church, play, uh, family, that kind of thing, and, um, and, and attitudes about the war uh, so that we could make something more than an educated, uh, more of an educated guess instead of just a wild ass guess uh, um, about who would be a good juror and who wouldn't be. Um, so the, the people who were giving us feedback were um, um, also given us, uh, for about jurors, were also giving us some of the information that we had correlations for and that would help us, we thought. So that goes out, uh, it gets done. We've managed to talk the judge very grudgingly, he, into giving us a room in the courthouse where we could have some privacy. The FBI were in that courthouse on the same floor. The United States Attorney was on that same floor. The judges' chambers were on that same floor, and we had to go out someplace else. So we shamed him, literally, into giving us some space there. We had had phone lines brought into that space so that we could communicate, and uh, that's the only way you did it, of course, was with uh, phone lines. Um, and we were in the process after the first day of jury s uh, selection, <clears throat> um, and this information was being called into the, the information was being called into a central people who were uh, summarizing it and, and per for each one, and then sending it, calling it into us, getting get, calling it into the courthouse. So we're in there having a, this post first day of jury selection conversation about prospective jurors and things. Um, and other stuff that we don't want the government to know, when Peter noticed that there was a return air vent in the wall and on the other, looking through that return, you know what I mean by return air vent? Yeah. So for you people, those who are listening to this later on, it's a grill that if you look at the right angle, you can see through the wall into what's on the other side. It's just to let the air flow through there is all it is. Um, and uh, you can look through there and see on the other side, a pair of men's pants legs and a pair of shoes. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain they were FBI-issued shoes at that time. I'm not sure of that. I usually make a flat foot joke here. Uh, but, uh, and it was like, what the? So while that was going on, several of us, trying to be unobtrusive, slip out the door and go around to the judges' chambers. By now, the prosecutors have all gone. Um, the judge is still there, and the press has gone, and the press was really helpful to us because they kept everybody honest. If you ever want someone to make an argument for a free press, I will do it because I strongly believe in it. Yes, strongly, strongly. Watch, have represented the, New, the Gainesville Sun, the New York Times, the Florida Alligator in past years, and, uh, and loved every bit of it. Uh, and. Um, so we go to the judge and, and tell him that there's somebody in this room right next to us, um, and we, we're not sure what's going on. He doesn't want to hear about it. He doesn't want to talk about it. It's the end of the day, and we're not much fun. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he, he finally agrees to call the marshal. He calls the, the, the head marshal, who was the head that day, not the, the big mm -hmm. boss. Um, um, gosh, I can almost remember his name. Um, and um, he comes in and the judge says, what is that room? And he's like, you know, let's get this over with and move along. And he says, uh, judge, that's a, a broom closet. And it's like, a broom closet? <laughs> I wonder what a guy is doing in a broom closet. And he says, well, go down there and, 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 and if, there's, if there's anybody in that closet, bring them here. So we go tiptoeing down the hallway to the, the door. He opens the door to the broom closet and there stand two FBI agents, and you know they're FBI agents because at least the one, the whole telephone network goes, is in that closet, including ours. <laughs> one of them is headphones and plugged in to, I'm not making this up, plugged into this thing. Now these guys can tell you they saw it, or some of them saw it too, Peter saw it, um, and, um, um, and he like, <laughs> you know, like, what, what, what? <laughs> and, and, uh, he unplugs himself. He's got a briefcase, um, and um, he's got a piece of paper in his hand about the size of this. Um, and um, 
He puts it in his coat pocket, and that's why I remember he had a coat on. He slips it into his coat pocket. And um, the marshal says, the judge wants you to come around here. So he picks up the briefcase and takes it with him, and he put the other stuff into it. I don't, I don't remember seeing him do that, but when, when we got there, the, he's got the briefcase. He's not holding the headphones or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, and so my memory of this is I'm now the big mouth because they'd come to me, Peter had come to me, mm. um, because frankly the other guys were doing more important stuff probably, mm -hmm. uh, the other lawyers. Uh, and, um, and I tell him what, 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 what's going on. Um, and, uh, well, Mr. Turner, what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, you are, we've got these, this information coming in, this private information. Uh, we, we would like you to seal that room, make, it, make sure it stays sealed overnight. We would like you to confiscate the briefcase. And by the way, he has this piece of paper that I, he had in his hand, and I saw him put it in his pocket when we came in. And we'd like you to get to take that too. And we would like us to be able to have our own experts check to see what's going on. Now, I have to tell you, I could not have made all that up. Some of that mm -hmm. had to come mm -hmm. as suggestions from some of the more mm -hmm. experienced lawyers. But that's what I said. Uh, uh, the judge liked me best because I was a gainsful guy. Mm -hmm. And he would get mad at me and he would slam, he always had a handful of, of, of pencils, mm -hmm. and he'd use them, and he would slam them down on the bench and say, Mr. Turner, come into chambers right now. And we'd go back there and say, now Larry, Larry, you're one of my boys. <laughs> Don't you let those New York lawyers get you in trouble. Now, he didn't say New York Jewish lawyers, but that's what he meant. <laughs> Don't you let those New York Jews get you in trouble. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Judge, I'm, you know, I'm just doing what I, I'm trying, you know, whatever it took. They wanted to come back with me. I said, no, 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 no. I'll mm -hmm. let me deal with the judge on my own. So they knew that he would listen to me a little bit, and I hadn't yet burned all my bridges. And um, so he said he, he wasn't going to do it. Oh, he even asked the guy what was in the briefcase when I said mm -hmm. the briefcase, mm -hmm. and the guy opened it. And when you open that briefcase, this was one of those metal, lightweight briefcases, and when you opened it, it was, had the foam with the cutouts where everything had its little place, mm. and it looked like something. I mean, it's not 1973, but you knew what it was. Yeah. You know, it was, it, it was uh, eavesdropping equipment is exactly what it was. There was no doubt about it, yeah, yeah. you know. And we're saying they were plugged into the switchboard. Yeah. So uh, um, Everybody goes, he doesn't do anything. Um, we go home, uh, we go to where we were staying at that time. We were staying in some apartments we were renting so we could be together and work together. And um, um, the Gainesville newspaper, the headline, and my memory is it was the headline story, is a photograph of the third floor of the federal building with the lights on. And the storyline, the headline is that the FBI worked late last night, the lights were on and all night long. Uh, and um, so we go to court the next morning and the judge says, you know, Mr. Turner, I've been thinking about this. I'm, I'm going to order that room sealed and I'm going to make them turn over that briefcase. And uh, well, thank you, Judge, how about the piece of paper? No, 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 I'm not going to make them do that. Um, and so, well, big deal, right? I mean. They've had all night long right, right. to do whatever they, they want, want to do to with do it, it, you yeah, know. Yeah. So, we so we had somebody come in and do what his forensics investigation. Of course, he couldn't find anything, um, um, and uh, so and we moved on. I mean, that mm -hmm. that was just a blip in it, but it was another blip. Yeah. And uh, you know, there were so many blips um, that before long, it's like this is just not fair. <laughs> These guys are cheating. <laughs> And, uh, but, but we won it anyhow, um, and we won it because, because it was a made-up story. I mean, there was, they, they took elements of truth, the best lies in the world, right? You take an element of truth and you then wrap your lie around it, and I can show you that this is true, an element of truth, the uh, slingshots. You know about the slingshots, mm -hmm. okay? The slingshots, so that's true. It isn't true they were going to start a war with them, but it is true that they shot them from their house across Caddy Corner across the street to the young, what are they called? They're still there today. Young, oh, they, they were the right wing mm. <laughs> club, uh, mm. a political club. 
And uh, in fact, the guy who was at the time the uh, leader of that club wound up being called as a witness by the government, mm -hmm. um, which actually worked to our advantage, <laughs> as it turned out. That's they it. didn't expect that. They didn't play, didn't prepare their witnesses very well at all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they would talk about, they, they were called something, something rocket slingshot, slingshots. I've forgotten exactly. Um, but they, you, you, you had a handle here, and then it braced on, wrist. on the arm. Yeah, on the arm like that, so that you had, you know, you didn't lose. You weren't doing this when you're pulling that rubber back. Um, and they, so they had some accuracy to them. And Scott and them would shoot cherry bombs across the street <laughs> into their yard, mm -hmm. and they would. I, I don't remember if they did the same thing back, but they, this kind of college boy, fraternity boy mm -hmm. stuff was going on, and this, that's really what it was. <laughs> But it sounded, sounded awful. The, the, the story was that they were going to take those, roll them in epoxy, and then, uh, or cover them in epoxy, and roll them in BBs, and shoot them into the crowd. And then they would explode and hurt people. Uh, they wouldn't kill anybody, but they would hurt people. Mm -hmm. And that would cause a riot. Uh, and then the cops would come over like they did in Chicago and beat everybody up. Um, and uh, the Vietnam veterans against the war would be no more. Uh, you know, because they were the evil people. Uh, uh, so uh, that that's the truth and that's the lie. Uh, and that's, you know, over the years of being a lawyer and a judge, you see a lot of liars. And the best, the best ones take a kernel of truth and work it. Uh, so, um, so that's the story. What else? Uh, we're looking for stories that where the where the government looks like it's cheating. Um, they called Whitney. You know, this is just crazy. That um, I told you that the fellow who was the president of the other organization testified, <clears throat> and he testified about all that. But on cross examination, when I asked him, "Well, uh, did you ever go in the in the the, the VVAW house?" Oh yeah. Um, you know, I'd go over there and talk to Scott. Now, we, they weren't buddies, but they were friendly adversaries, right, right. you know. Um, and I said, would you ever see any guns in there? No. I mean, did you, Scott ever talk to you about guns? No. Um, so he wound up just being a fizzle. I mean, mm -hmm. he admitted that, yeah, we played these games. That was it. I mean, he didn't try to make it any more than that. Um, he was an honest guy, you know, is what he was. Scott's best guy friend at the time, whose name I'm not going to remember either. This was 50 years ago. Y'all have to forgive me. <laughs> uh, telling me my battery's running down. That probably means I'm talking too long. So, <laughs> uh, stop me when you want to. No, that's right, there, there are hundreds of these stories. There really are. I mean, it's this amazing great. how many of these stories there are. They usually come up when somebody says something that triggers it for me. Yeah. I say, oh yeah, there was that too. Um, so. Um, this guy worked at the VA. He was a veteran. He was a, a good friend of Scott. Scott and his girlfriend, Nancy, and this guy and his wife um, played cards together, I think. I don't remember what cards. I don't think it was poker. But they got together frequently and had dinner together and played cards. And Scott told him everything, everything. So he's called as a witness. And he is going to apparently tell everything. And when and in the federal court at that time, you don't know who the next witness is until they say, call Mr. So and so. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't have any idea, you don't have a witness list, you don't know who the witnesses mm -hmm. are. Now you do today. There are ways you can get it done today. With most judges you can get it all today. Even then some judges don't allow you to know the order in which they're being called until they're called. Now mm -hmm. the better judges will say who are you going to call tomorrow, what sequence, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So you can do some preparation. Um, but then, uh, no. So uh, the next witness they call was this guy whose name will come to me, maybe. Um, and Scott turns to me and says, my guy, Larry, that's my best friend. Mm. And the government's calling him as a witness. Mm. And he came in, and he basically didn't have much of a story to tell either. Uh, did you ever see any guns there? No. Did Scott ever um, talk to you about uh, uh, going to the Republican National Committee? No. Best friend now, you mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. Scott trusted him. 
um, um, uh, in fact, when Scott would go out of town, he would, Scott had guns. Oh yeah, Scott had guns, I have guns, he was saying. Mm -hmm. You know, we're veterans, we all have guns, you know, <laughs> we went to Vietnam. Uh, uh, and um, at that time, the, the PTSD thing was not known about. It wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't known then like it is now. It wasn't even called that. It was called the post-Vietnam syndrome, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Post-Vietnam syndrome was what it was called. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were going to do something with that if we had to. Um, uh, luckily, we didn't have to. Um, and um, so basically, he said uh, if, when Scott would, would go out of town, he would bring his guns to my house and leave them with me. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody that knows Scott is he didn't bring all, take all of them because Scott was never unarmed, mm -hmm. hardly ever unarmed. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was taught by the Marines that your gun is, is your life. absolutely, and you don't leave it anywhere. Right. And if he didn't have he didn't have a long gun with him most of the time, but he had a, he had a pocket gun of some sort all the time. Um, and as a result of his paranoia, I have some guns um, that he gave to me, <laughs> <laughs> and I still have some of them. Um, so um, so that guy kind of fizzled out. They called several witnesses who were who. Um, were gainsful people that I knew enough about that I could actually pick up the phone and call my friends at the state attorney's office, investigators there, and tell me everything you know about one of the guys' name was Tex something, and he was a private investigator. And I knew they thought he was a scum. Mm. I knew that about him. So tell me everything you know. Or they were willing to tell me everything because they liked me mm. and I liked them. We were good friends. You know, we'd work together. And so when I got that guy on cross-examination, I could just destroy him with all the crap that he was guilty of. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that was the first or second witness. The other first or second witness was a guy who had run a, a, a program in the city of Gainesville, uh, a housing program for, for people who did, affordable housing program, that's what it was. Uh, even way back then, they weren't doing a good job with it. Uh, and this guy wound up uh, stealing funds from it. Mm -hmm. And apparently the prosecutor didn't know. He didn't have the job anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> so he didn't last long on the witness stand either. So we pretty much destroyed all of their first witnesses just because they either wouldn't lie or they would lie, but they weren't credible. Mm -hmm. So th th that happened. Uh, you probably know about the Victory Party and the pe people who came to the Victory Party. You know about this? It does. No, I don't. In order to get into the courthouse for the first time in, that I was had ever heard of, uh, they had metal detectors because they were really afraid mm -hmm. that, of these guys and, and, and others. And, uh, they, they believed, uh, they really believed, or some believed, I don't know the, what some, the organizers probably knew, but mm -hmm. some believed, you know, John Kerry was one of the founders of this organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> I'd love to tell that. And uh, um, so they had metal detectors, and the guys would have to go, we all had to, everybody had to go through, but the guys had to go through it. Well, th those who served, most of them had metal in their bodies from, from, from you know, uh, mm -hmm. shrapnel. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott was, uh, shot twice on two different tours. Uh, he, uh, I mean, Scott uh, can tell you, and I sure has told you just horrible stories. And um, so they would set it off, and then they'd get the wand out and wand everybody. Uh, and we would have to be in the courtroom and in our seats before the judge would even bring the jury to the courthouse mm. because he was so afraid that there would be something that would happen. And. Um, So, what, where was I going with that? Um, oh, turns out, so the, you know, jurors are in, are impacted by this kind of stuff too. They're they're sequestered. They're not allowed to read newspapers, uh, or they get newspapers that the articles have been cut out of. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to watch any television uh, that has anything. Uh, television news, basically, they're cut off from. In, in theory, at least, they're cut off from that. I think that rarely works very well, but that was what they were doing. Um, and um, the, on that jury were two black guys. Uh, uh, and um, after 
the trial later on, they told us that um, after the first two witnesses testified, they quit paying any attention to anybody. They didn't trust anything anybody else said. Mm. A lot of black guys back then and today, understandably, don't trust, trust mm -hmm. law enforcement because they've lived the life. And um, the other thing that happened with those same two guys at the end of, the, of all the evidence and before final arguments, the judge did something I never did understand. He released the jurors for a long weekend and we all took a long weekend so we could have some time to prepare to present our case. And these two guys were walking down University Avenue in Gainesville on one side of University Avenue downtown, uh, just where Maine and University intersect, at the, the west of that. And two of our guys were walking on the other side of the road in the other direction, and these two guys mm. raised a fist in salute to our guys. Wow. <laughs> and we knew then we were probably going to win this case. We were pretty <laughs> sure. And that was a strong, strong hint. And I have to tell you, one of those guys wound up being a lawyer. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, and a good one, wow. and a good one, uh, and I didn't want him on that jury because he was mm. boisterous and loud and strong and going to do the, you know, the right thing, uh, and uh, <laughs> and he's that kind of guy. Wow, wow, uh, yeah, and and a good guy mm. and a good lawyer, mm. uh, but he had he wasn't anywhere close to law school at that moment right. in his life, you right. know. Right. <laughs> Stephen Mickel was still in law school. Mm. Well, no, Stephen and I were classmates. So, okay, okay. Um, and, and good friends. Mm. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what was the legal strategy you guys had? What, what, what was uh, the what? Legal strategy? What, did you, what was your What plan? was our strategy? Yeah. Well, it changed during the trial, as is often the case. Um, we weren't really sure what people were going to say. One of the other things that happened, many of the, several of the witnesses who were called, um, one of them famously testified she was a Cuban American with heavy uh, English accent, heavy Cuban accent in her English. Mm -hmm. And she testified, and, and the thing I remember about her when she was asked, uh, were there many spies involved in this investigation? And her response was, darling, the spies were spying on the spies. There were so many. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. there, that, that, am I overstaying? No. I just told them about the spies spying on the spies. About what? Spies spying on the spies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, <laughs> darling. <laughs> uh, and uh, very dramatically. Uh, I don't remember her testimony at all. I just remember that. Uh, so, um, the strategy. The strategy was if we had to, uh, there was talk, uh, and and the guys um, would talk about what guys might do. Uh, so is if is is talk a conspiracy? Uh, you know, we could do this, we could do that. We smoke weed, um, we get angry, we talk about stuff we can do. The next morning, everything's happy again. Uh, how much heavy talk? I don't know. A plan? Never. A plan, and and there's evidence of that. Scott was going to leave his guns with. He's left. I was going to ask him that guy's name. Um, uh, so the, the kernel of truth would have been there was talk, uh, and the, the 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 whole truth is, yeah. Was there ever any even implicit agreement to do anything other than talk about it? Uh, 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 sort of like the boys at the fraternity house who are talking about having a panty raid, but. Yeah, just talk about it and dream about it, but hardly ever do it. Mm -hmm. Once in a while they do. And usually that's the fraternity, I mean, uh, the group from the dorm next door, not, not the fraternity. <laughs> so uh, so, th so th we had, I mentioned a PTSD. Um, gosh, this is a name I ought to be able to remember for you. There was a guy who was a famous author of nonfiction. He had written a, bo a book about the survivors of Hiroshima and was quite well known for it. And he had just finished a book about the Vietnam, post-Vietnam syndrome. Um, and he was going to be a, a witness for us to say, guys who have been, to, who've been in this situation like guns, you know, most, frankly, most military people have guns. Uh, uh, guys who have come, come back from Vietnam 
talk about violence. One of our defendants tried to turn himself in at the, v at the VA hospital to get some help. And because he knew he wasn't getting help. And he told him, you know, I have, I think about going up on um, the tower, this had happened at the University of Texas, and shoot people from the, the tower. I mm -hmm. think about doing those things. Well, you know, go, go away. Mm -hmm. He picked up a typewriter and threw it through the glass window that the people were on the other side of, and they decided to listen to him. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's the kind of, I mean, I, I would have walked away probably, but I wasn't in Vietnam. Uh, yeah. So, um, and this guy was going to help shed light on all of this based upon the incredible amount of research that he had done. Um, but because all of that fizzled, um, uh, you know, by the time we were done, uh, I, th I think that the whole jury was convinced by the time and we thought they were. So we decided there was one thing we felt like we had to rebut and it was something Someone had testified that Scott was talking about a way to make a bomb, which Scott might very well have been doing, um, and was teaching them how to do it and was telling that he told you do this and you do that and you do the other. And so we hired, we had a bomb expert come in to say that would never explode. Mm. Uh, wow. uh, so if Scott was doing that, uh, he wasn't very good at it. Uh, or, uh, um, and I don't know if he was doing it or not. Scott, you probably know this, represented himself at trial. Uh, yeah, which was a really masterful idea. It wasn't mine. Um, it was a great idea. He and one other guy did. Uh, and um, what it did is it allowed him to cross-examine witnesses. And Scott's very smart, uh, but he's not legally trained. And he's smart, en smart enough to know, behind, uh, know to hide behind the fact that he's not legally trained. I cannot ask a leading question, perhaps, but he leads all over the place, and the judge, he gets yeah. an objection, and the judge sustains it, and, oh, I'm sorry, judge, and then he does it again. Uh, <laughs> and he made his own final argument. Uh, I, I, I was assigned one of the other defendants to make my, uh, as, as my client. Uh, and uh, the chair of the, of the jury wrote an article uh, soon thereafter um, for a newspaper and said that uh, that it, uh, her, his final argument brought t tears to her eyes mm -hmm. and it was an outstanding final argument but he could do it by saying and then I and then he as opposed to the evidence shows you know lawyers get so hung up in doing it the right way the good ones don't do it the right way but uh, you know the, you, you, you talk to jurors like you're t I'm talking to you um, as long as you know how to do that and stay within, you know, color within the lines, you, you get away with it. The others say, and then the evidence shows this, and the evidence shows that. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So what was the, I guess, the, the main message you wanted to get to the jury? Okay. <laughs> You're going to get two views of this. The guys, the defendants, okay, okay I don't know what to do. We need to get it on a charger. Um, um, the guys wanted to take the stand and make a political statement. Mm. Uh, they wanted to get up there and talk about how the war was bad, all the horrible things that happened there, the horrible things they did, that they did it because Uncle Sam made them do it. And they were willing to go to jail to make their point. Mm. <clears throat> and they believed that was an important thing to do. And there were heated, angry arguments between some of them um, amongst themselves, uh, some of them didn't want to go to jail. Uh, you know, John Niffen hadn't been to Vietnam. He was just friends of some of those guys, and he got swept up in this thing. Uh, and, um, uh, and the lawyers are saying, look, guys, the best statement you can make is a not guilty verdict. A not guilty verdict in this case will get huge headlines. So, you know, what you say on the witness stand will be forgotten, about the, uh, for, forgotten the day after tomorrow. Uh, uh, so they finally agreed that they were not going to get up there and basically commit suicide by pissing off the judge and the jurors and everybody else and said, well, you can't let these guys out. Um, and so um, that's pretty much it. Now, you've asked them the same question. They probably, I assume if you haven't, you should. They, they uh, have a better way of saying their answer than that, but we were actually talking about that just a little bit downstairs a few minutes ago. And, uh, 
And Peter was one of those who really wanted to tell his story. John Chambers, another one. Uh, uh, so um, they, they're still here. Mm. <laughs> you can ask them. Wow. Um, so, you know, as you've been practicing law for much, long, much you know, longer than that, you've grown in your career much and your, I guess, your legal prowess and skill. How have you had cases that were n anywhere near as, I guess, um, interesting, if you will, as the well, case gosh. of Scott Camillion? Yeah. That's, I don't know that that's, can we turn this fan on? Sure. Why in the world are we sitting here? Turn the light? Well, you want the light, probably. There you go. Well, let's there you turn go. that on. All right. I'm sorry, I wish I'd seen it and noticed it earlier. <laughs> well, first, um, I'm reasonably smart. Um, and I, too, have a good head, good heart, and good ball, and balls. So, you know, I've got that. I learned more in this one case than you, I mean, you just can't even imagine. You're fresh out of law school. You've got all that academic stuff. But now it's happening, and it's happening in unimaginable ways. I mean, ways that would I, never happen in any court I prosecuted in, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I, had, I did have cops that would say, this is what happened, and this is what we're going to say. And I'd say, no, no, no. Well, they wised up. They would just say, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. And they'd tell me the lie instead mm -hmm. of, you know, this is what we're going to say. Uh, but, you know, so I've, I've had that. And there were cops who were willing to commit perjury. They didn't think a little bit of truth should get in the way of, of a conviction. Uh, so uh, they, they would lie about it. And, and uh, uh, But nothing like this. I mean, nothing ever like this. Now, the war on drugs, I did a, a fair amount of of work in the war, in that uh, defending um, both marijuana and then even in the cocaine wars, um, and but nothing like this. I mean, again, you've got uh, undercover agents whose job it is to, to lie. That's what they do. They've got to lie to get you to believe them, so you'll do business with them, right? Uh, so. Um, and, and they got to get your trust, so if, if they're trying to do business with you and you put a line of cocaine on the table and say, hey, let's do some cocaine, mm -hmm. and you think, oh, he's got a gun, and if I don't do cocaine, he's going to use it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then they get caught up in the gamesmanship of it. They want to win. They want to, mm -hmm. they want to win. Sometimes I think they're true believers that it's really a terrible thing. Um, and it is, by the way. I think cocaine's a terrible drug. Um, um, but I don't think the war on drug did anything except make it worse. Uh, um, and then when crack came along and we decided that, the government decided that they would make crack more punishable. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't think that was a racist decision, you ain't paying attention. So um, uh, there were those cases, uh, you know, and I tried them in different, I tried, wound up trying cases all over. Um, the southeastern, pretty much, uh, United States, um, and, and enjoyed it for a while. It was fun. And then it was like, what city am I in, and why am I here? And, and last week it was there, and then tomorrow I'm flying to, and, um, and so I, uh, in 1985, we had a baby, and I, and I quit flying. <laughs> and uh, changed my practice to more of a local kind of practice. Um, uh, so no, I didn't have another Gainesville 8 case. The Gainesville 8 case, most people don't get. I mean, there aren't many of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm on the nightly news every night um, so that people who, who knew me and didn't like me suddenly were my best friends, you know, <laughs> and, and were bragging about it and, yeah. and, and that kind of thing. And I told you, I told you about the guy and the, and the glass of wine. No? Okay. I, um, I had a, we, we, Golden and I had a law clerk. Um, we worked, uh, well, I, I was a law clerk before I was part of the firm. And this guy had played basketball at Jacksonville University. Um, um, uh, and a um, tall guy and a very good basketball player and a, and a good law student. Um, so when he graduated law school, he went to uh, France and played basketball uh, for a French team. and. Um, he sent me a copy of the, uh, 
National, what is it, International Herald of the Tribune, mm -hmm. which is a newspaper I think published by, uh, I, I don't know who it is. I, I think New York Times has had something to do with it. But anyhow, it's 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 published for Americans basically mm -hmm. to read the news back home. And he sent me this copy of this newspaper with a big red stain on it, and he told me he was in a bar drinking a glass of wine when he saw my name in the paper, and he knocked the glass of wine over. So he got that kind of attention. Well, you don't wow. get much of that, especially yeah. you know, two, three years out of law school. Uh, so uh, it certainly had an impact in, in that regard, and it certainly took me to other places that I may never have gone. Um, you know, it was certainly an incredible kickstart. And I was a much, much, much better lawyer from having done it. Having been a judge, I was a better lawyer after doing that, but I, 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 eight years of that was enough, and because judges, you have to follow stupid laws that they make in Tallahassee, and I'd rather be outside trying to make those laws go away than enforcing them. So, minimum mandatory sentences, one size fits all. Yeah. You know, crazy stuff. Crazy. Um, that's all the questions for me, Ms. Deborah Bruce. I'll think of 20 stories questions. tonight, but that's enough for me, too. <laughs> Thank you so much oh, for sure. your time Thank today. You. It's Thank you good for your interest in this. Absolutely. It's relevant today because yes. of what's going on today. It, yes. it really is. It's more relevant today than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. It is relevant today. Yeah. We have got to find a way to get along with our brothers and sisters, regardless of their ideology. So we just got to her. We're tearing this country apart. And it, it breaks their hearts, these guys there who, who fought yeah. for their country and then tried to set it on the right path, and it breaks my heart. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you.